Welcome. We're so glad you joined us for our October edition of Native Plants at Noon. I'm Tammy Thompson, Outreach Manager for Deep Roots. I had so much fun last month with Alex, Sydney, and you all that I decided to come back this month. I look forward to seeing you all each month as we continue to unpack the wonders of native plants and their habitat. I would like to start by thanking Sarah Beyer. As some of you already know, last week was Sarah's last week with Deep Roots. We are so excited for Sarah's next adventure and her new opportunities, but we also will miss her. So we wanted to wish her, uh, wish her well and just let you know to wish her well as well. If you have questions today, please note those in the Facebook comments uh, or in the Q&A tool on Zoom and we'll get to as many of those as we can. Uh, I'll be using the chat feature to send the names of each plant as we come to them. Uh, before we get started, I wanna do a big thank you to Missouri Department of Conservation for their partnership on this series and everything they do to help encourage and empower people to plant more native plants. With that, I'd like to welcome Sydney Ross and Alex Daniel at the Anita B. Gorman Discovery Center. Uh, Sydney and Alex, take it away. Thank you so much, Tammy. We appreciate it. Thanks, Tammy. I'm Sydney, and this is Alex. Hello. And we are two native landscape specialists here at the Anita B. Gorman Discovery Center in Kansas City. And before we begin um, our topic today, which focuses on autumn shrubs and trees, we would like to open our program with a land acknowledgement to the indigenous peoples who have lived um, in this area. We'd like to acknowledge that the Anita B. Gorman Conservation Discovery Center is located on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Kaw Nation, Osage Nation, Lakota Dakota Nation, and the Kickapoo Tribe. The process of knowing and acknowledging the ground beneath our feet is a way of honoring and expressing gratitude for the people on this land before us. It familiarizes visitors with the cultures and histories of Missouri's indigenous tribes, as well as their ties in the Kansas City region. We honor our heritage of native peoples and what they teach us about stewardship of the earth. We bring this up because we think it's important for us to talk about this especially as native landscape specialists. And we know that it's easy to talk the talk, but we want to acknowledge the work of reconciliation as uh, non-indigenous people, because it's not enough to read a script. So before we begin, I wanna leave you with a few questions to think about as we move through the seasons. What privileges do we have on this land because of colonialism? What can you do to better care for the land? and who lived on this land before you? These are questions and there will be many more questions we think about as we self-educate ourselves and continue to learn about the indigenous history that we have our feet upon. Thank you. All right, should we get started? Let's do it. So as I mentioned, we're gonna be talking about um, native uh, shrubs and trees that are beautiful in the fall and have ecological purpose in your own backyard. Oh, do you want to do the book first? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Apologize. So we do want to plug um, this great book called Braiding Sweetgrass by Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer. It combines indigenous teaching with the studies of botany. It's beautifully written. Um, I've listened to the audio book um, and Ro Dr. Robin Wall Kimmerer um, narrates it herself and she's just got a great voice and great insight. Um, and she's also doing a virtual lecture on Wednesday, November 10th. Um, so Tammy's gonna go ahead and put that in the link or in the chat, the link in the chat below. And I hope you'll join us at that presentation because we will definitely will be, be attending. There. We'll be there. All right, All without right. further ado, we're going to talk about some Missouri native shrubs and trees. So what's our first shrub, Sydney? Okay, so this, this is a pretty tall shrub. It's limbed out quite well, but this is the spice bush. Um, and the spice bush is, has these gorgeous red berries. Let's see if we can get a good image here. That's yeah, perfect. They turn red this time of year. Um, it's got slender stems, glossy oval shaped leaves. The 
fruits here that you see are really important for birds. Um, they're also edible to humans. I've started collecting some spice bush berries to dry and grind into a spice. Um, but this is a great understory tree that you can add into your backyard if you're looking for some structural plants. Um, it does, it's a perch shade species. It can handle some sun too. And uh, something that's kind of interesting about this tree is it is the host to the spice bush swallowtail caterpillar, which turns in, I like this little caterpillar. It kind of looks like a snake. Um, I like that biomimicry it's got going on here. Yeah, it has eyes, it, scary, scary eyes. It does have scary eyes. Yeah, and then it transforms into this butterfly. The spice bush swallowtail butterfly. Um, this year, Alex and I have been challenged with trying to identify various butterflies that all kind of look like this, from um, the eastern swallowtail to the is it the purple? What, yeah, red spotted swallow? purple. Red spotted purple. I yes. always get mixed up on that one. Um, but if you're looking for a beautiful understory tree for your yard, as well as something that is a great host plant for uh, native insects to your area, you might consider this tree. Yeah, and this can I mention also that it's a great substitute for honeysuckle, for bush honeysuckle, because it has a similar structure and um, red berries, and then it has gorgeous flowers in the spring. I was reading um, that some folks refer to it as forsythia of the woods. Um, <laughs> forsythia is a non-native uh, shrub that you'll find commonly throughout the Kansas City region. It has yellow flowers in the spring and yellow foliage as the leaves fade. So maybe consider um, the spice bush, which the, the Latin name, by the way, is um, Lindera benzoin. Did I like that. that right? I like Lindera benzoin. benzoin. That's how I say benzoin. Latin's hard, y'all. But it's important to reference yes. Latin when you're choosing a true native for your yard. Especially shrub, shrubs and trees because they are cultivated mm -hmm. beyond their natural state. That's true. Okay. Yeah, that's a very good point. Okay, so though we're mostly talking about shrubs and trees, we'd be remiss if we didn't mention one of our favorite asters that is still blooming this time of year. Enter the aromatic aster. Okay, I'm gonna try to pronounce this Latin name. It is a mouthful. You got this. Bear with me. Symphiotrichum oblongifolium. How would you say that, Alex? Oblongifolium, yep, oblongifolium. you got it. You <laughs> got it. It's a mouthful. So asters are really important uh, fall plants for our native pollinators. They're high in protein and rich in nectar, which is crucial as, um, oh, we've got a bee following us right here. As we go into the cooler months, um, so for migratory pollinators like the monarchs as they make their way to Mexico, and just to give our local pollinators a little oomph before winter sets in. This is a shorter shrub. It prefers full sun. It can handle a little bit of shade, but it doesn't get much taller than this. So it's, um, it's, it, it's a little more tidy compared to the New England aster, which can get really tall. Um, but an interesting way to maintain this shrub, well, it's not a shrub, but it, it kind of looks like one, doesn't it? It is shrub shaped it's for shrub -shaped, sure. For sure. Um, but you can cut back the stems to about, I don't know, half or a third of the height in June. Alex lovingly calls this the Chelsea chop. And by doing that, it encourage, encourages a more compact growth with extra blooms of flowers. So if you're looking for something to be a little more tidy, maybe consider the aromatic aster. Um, it is the latest blooming of our fall asters here in Missouri. It'll keep blooming probably into December this yeah. year. Yeah, yeah, it definitely could. So. It did last year. It kept blooming into December. Yeah, and it's uh, like New England asters already finished blooming. Mm -hmm. um, so this is really one of the few plants that are left blooming here at the Discovery Center, except for a few uh, plants which are blooming, even though they're not supposed to be blooming this time of year. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. What's our next one? So we're going to move on and talk about American Beauty Berry. But as we are making our way to the next stop, Tammy, feel free to chime in with any questions from our audience. If we have any to start off with. Or, or we'll keep well. labbing. Or we'll just keep talking. Now we've got some questions. Let's go ahead and we have not um, from Maureen. She says, neither of my spice bushes get berries. Mm. That might answer a couple of the other, other questions in our Q&A okay. too. So that is a great question. And I uh, apologize for not bringing this up, but spice bushes are known as dioecious plants, meaning they, you need a female and male plant within proximity in order to get those luscious red berries. 
So we always recommend you plant at least a few, maybe three or more plants because you can't really tell which plants are male or female. Um, but that is true. They do need uh, both of those male and female plants in order to get those red fruits. Yeah, in pretty close proximity, I think. Different shrubs have different distances yeah. that you can reliably get like um, fruit from if you have a male and female. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, check the distance on that and plant more. The answer is always <laughs> plant more. And from a designer standpoint, I love odd numbers. Um, so why not plant three? Five. 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 <laughs> not seven. seven. Depending on the size of your space, of course. Uh, that's a great question. Thanks for bringing that up. And we have one more it, uh, along the spice bush um, uh, subject. How can, and this is from Ruth, how can we simply tell the difference between spice bush and honeysuckle? Ooh, that's a great <gasps> oh, question. Oh, that's Alex, a great question. Um, yes, I'm going to talk about it for a minute and then we can look at this other one over here real quick and I can show you what. Um, so the, the berries on the honeysuckle are going to be round, red. There's going to be four berries per spot um for honeysuckle, for honeysuckle. Yeah. yes that's one difference spice bush berries are oblong and they have a very distinct smell to them they're very one. dry yeah we might have one here's one right here this spice bush is just not as beautiful right now here's one yeah. oh yeah Perfect. so the spice bush whoops sorry the berries there we go are more oblong like that uh and then also the honeysuckle, it has opposite limb structure. We don't have a honeysuckle around Thank here, goodness. do we? we don't have yeah, well, we have plenty of it, but not right in this area. <laughs> um, honeysuckle has opposite uh, branching, which means on the stem, the, the, the uh, buds come out on at the same point on the branch mm -hmm. um, and they go out um, from the exact same point. So alternate branching is what spice bush has. Can you see that? I don't know if here, that's very good. Yeah. Here. Here's a branch. There's a branch. So they kind of zigzag down this. Yeah, side. you're not gonna have two two branches coming out of one spot. Um, I think those are the easiest ways. To also, tell the, the way the leaf smells. So I'm crushing up this leaf. It kind of smells like citronella. It does. Oh, the leaves, the bark, the berries, everything about uh about spice bush smells. Mm -hmm. And that's one of my favorite ways to distinguish between like walnut and tree of heaven right. and staghorn sumac too they're really hard to tell um by their leaves and their bark sometimes so mm -hmm. sniffing is one of my favorite fun ways <laughs> you actually taught me that That's it's so easy right fun. telling a walnut and a tree of heaven smell very very, very different, different both very distinct and one other thing yeah. i want to mention about spice bush before we move on to the next plant is uh, i don't know if you can get a close-up i know this. that's gonna be hard i was go. just gonna see if i can Let's try this. This will be better to show in the spring, of course. But, so I mean, funner. To... I don't know if you can see these little buds right here, but the spice bush is uh, one of the few plants that blooms really early in the season, like sometimes as early as January or February, and it gets those uh, yellow little blossoms, which are pollinated by uh, moths. So yeah, that, that can warm up their body temps by vibrating their bodies. Oh, nice, nice. So, that's yeah, kind of a it's cool. a beautiful shrub in the spring. Yeah. Okay. And all year. So the next plant we're going to talk about before we take more questions is one of my favorites. It's the American Beauty Berry, also known as Calicarpa Americana. And check out those luscious clusters of fuchsia fruit. This is real, y'all, and is native to Missouri. This is not a cultivar. Um, so you can see those vibrant berry clusters, which uh, it flowers in about May or June and then turns into these berries at this time of year, which the birds love. You can actually see down here, looks like they've started to eat some of the fruit maybe. And yep, this area is sure. here. Um, it is a part sun shrub. It doesn't get much taller than three to five feet. Um, I have used this in a lot of um, <clears throat> recent plantings because it is a more formal, shorter shrub. Um, and there are some things you can do maintenance wise, even though it doesn't really need a whole lot of maintenance. Um, Alex, you actually taught me about this earlier this year, but you can cut the stems back. Um, I want to say, what was it? 10 inches um, after the leaves fall off in the later in winter um, or early spring to give it a more compact shape. 
Is there anything else you want to add to that? Yeah. In terms of uh, this learning? one's probably about two or three years old. So this one's a bit smaller. We've got ones that we let grow really big and they only get to be about Five feet four or so. yeah maybe not even five feet those are huge ones over by the, in the yeah in the courtyard area and uh, yeah super easy super simple shrub to another probably my favorite smelling Ugh. shrub yeah. I, the leaves of this plant smell so amazing the berries are technically edible um they don't taste they don't, great no, they're kind they of don't. perfumey but some people make a jam out of them that's a really nice light purple color that's so it's pretty it's pretty yeah yeah, yeah. add enough sugar anything can taste good right? yeah that's right and the the berries do persist throughout the winter for a while too so they'll stay and give you that beautiful pop of purple yeah if you learned anything from our uh, webinar today, it's go out and sniff some plants. Yeah, for real. I didn't know that was our theme today, but it is. Go smell plants. Okay, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and take over the camera, and Alex is going to share a few awesome um, autumn trees with us and a shrub. Do you have that bird? Is it? Oh, it's right here. Oh, okay. We'll do that second. Okay. So, yeah, the first one we're going to talk about is a, a, a small tree called winterberry and um let me see if i can pull that a little bit how's that oh that's great look, look at those vibrant. bright what shade of red do you call that man that's almost like it's not quite a red orange but it's so vibrant it's 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 a lot brighter than the spice bush berry um yeah. it might be easy to think that this is a bush honeysuckle um because of the shape true. of the berry but you can see how they're forming <clears throat> on the stems it's it's yeah. quite different yeah they're not in clusters of four like this like the uh honeysuckle is you're not going to find this shrub uh very often in the wild up here it's more of a southern species this is ilex verticillata um and it can handle full sun to part shade it likes uh it, it can handle a lot of different soil types but it really likes a loamy kind of acidic soil mm -hmm. so we don't really have the perfect um, conditions for it, but there, but we've made a few survive here. <laughs> um, we have a few cultivar ones. This is a plant that's highly, highly cultivated. You, mm -hmm. will, it's kind of hard to find, or it would have been a few years ago, hard to find the true native of this in a nursery because they're so cultivated to produce more berries, to be shorter, all these different things. So if you can find the true native of this, it's a lovely, lovely wintertime shrub. Yeah. And the the berries stay super red. We end up using these for. Um, like uh, for our, our, our holiday, holiday green. greenings to make swags and wreaths that you can then put outside and the birds can enjoy. Yeah, you get that aesthetic and ecological benefit. What that's more right. Could you ask Don't for? do that with honeysuckle oh, because then you're spreading. You know, that's a really good around. point. So yeah. that's something that came up last year. I I hadn't thought about it until Alex brought it up. Um, yeah, don't use the berries from bush honeysuckle in your wreaths because that just spreads this invasive species even more. But, but do use native fruits and then sprinkle them out over your garden. Bed. That's right. Is this one? This is a terrible example, isn't it? This is a pawpaw, though, and that's going to be the next plant we talk yeah. about. Usually, um, you see this, them together, like in little. Yeah, this is this one is um, an interesting. We'll just show the leaves and stuff because this will be that'll be okay to show and the fruits. But um, so this this tree is uh, this is the pawpaw tree. And um, the Latin name is Asamina triloba, and it is um, the most tropical tree we have in Missouri. It's also called the Missouri banana. <laughs> and um, if any of you have all, all have had papas before, um, the, you can you you know the texture is really it's creamy. It's really creamy. Yeah, it's really sweet. Um, it it's kind of a mix between a mango and a banana. Here's a couple of smaller papas. These were picked a few weeks ago so they're starting to turn brown up. but when they're soft like this and start turn brownish yellowish then they're really good to eat and they've got should i do it do should it I open it okay got this really soft sweet flesh on the inside and then they have these giant seeds and the seeds are covered in this kind of mucusy I yeah hate to use that word <laughs> i hate to do it but it it's is. true 
And the key to planting papas from the papas that you harvest is to plant them just like this. Don't clean them. Don't dry them out. Just put them right in the ground like this. Mm. We put some papas out, some older rotten ones for the squirrels. And now we have a ton of papa trees growing in this area, <laughs> actually, that are about two years old now. So exciting. Yes. It's an understory tree. Uh, you'll find this tree really commonly all around Kansas City. Um, they're everywhere. Swope Park, every yeah. every nice park that has a, a, a bottom land, a nice forest in it is going to have some pawpaws in it. Yeah. And the time of year, we're a little past the point of finding pawpaws. I think most people and animals have already gathered them. Mm -hmm. um, but late September, early October. Yep. That's typically um, the time. That's kind of the time we found a bunch yeah. at, earlier this fall. Yeah. So. But we couldn't pass up talking about them. So of course, next year, seen next year, now you've seen them next year. If you haven't had one, go out and get them. Yeah. They make a really good ice cream. They don't bake up very well, but you can use them like bananas yeah. and recipes too. Yeah. We got a great question about this understory tree in terms of the height. Mm -hmm. Um, so I believe it grows to be what, 15 to 25 feet. That sounds right. Yeah, that sounds about right yeah. for an understory tree. Mm -hmm. um, and understory, as y'all may know, means it needs to grow underneath taller trees. So this doesn't like to be exposed to direct hot sunlight. It prefers to yeah. grow underneath a tall canopy. Yeah. So if you're adding these in, this is another tree that um, uh, needs to have more than one in order to pollinate. Mm -hmm. um, it can't pollinate itself. It grows. Uh, uh, it can grow by. Uh, rhizome root system there can be many many trees on one root system so you want to make sure you've got genetic diversity in your pawpaw planting yeah and i saw someone mention the zebra swallowtail is the host oh, yeah. for this oh. um we actually have an image of that as well so again if you're looking for um not only a delicious fruiting tree and it does take a, a several years for these trees to produce fruit um like seven years yeah but you can all it also hosts the zebra swallowtail. Here's the caterpillar mm -hmm. with all the stripes. And then the next image we've got. Look at that. Look how beauty. striking that is. It's gorgeous. Isn't that gorgeous? So you've probably seen these flying through the Kansas City area and throughout Missouri. Um, but this yeah. is the zebra swallowtail. And so you're seeing those because we have these trees native to this area. They can only feed on pawpaws. That's right. Uh, and sassafras, I think, too. Okay. But yeah. they. Um, can uh so if you're seeing those that means that we've got the hosts around mm -hmm. here so add on add yeah on. and you know and if you don't have the host plants for that particular insect then or yeah then we don't have those insects so that's why it's important to plant these native plants um because we can lose entire species without them yeah do you want to stay here for the next yeah one? okay so the next tree i'm going to talk about and our final tree in our, final in our series is the persimmon And unfortunately, here's this guy. Yeah. <laughs> unfortunately, we don't, we have persimmons here at the Discovery Center, but um, they, we believe they're cultivars and they're not quite exhibiting the bark that we would typically see on a wild persimmon. So we're going to show some pictures instead. So these are the, let me go back to that. These, this is the bark of the persimmon tree. It's very distinct. It's very blocky, um, like scales. What do you yeah, call it? Yeah, I like, call it alligator skin. Alligator skin, yeah. yeah. Real blocky compared to like, look at this tree behind us. Which has more like stripey Vertical bark. stripes. There's yeah. not a lot of trees that have this distinct blocky like pattern. Square, yeah. So that they, it makes them really easy to find in um, when you're looking uh, for persimmons like in the um, spring before the fruits, if you're looking mm -hmm. to scout, whatever. But another way, to find them now is these gorgeous leaves. They start turning yellowish, orangish. Um, even now when we don't have a lot of full color yet on some of our trees, you can see these driving around like Swope Park. Mm -hmm. You can see them, they're just bright beacons of orange in the woods. And then they're gonna have their fruit, the persimmon. So these are persimmons. Oh, I love them, they're my favorite fall fruit. Mine too. Apologize for my nails, y'all, yeah, no, but look at that that is gorgeous yeah so the, this fruit this is my favorite too because this is my favorite uh fall fruit because these are not quite as sweet as the papas they've got a real fall vibe they're like kind of the pumpkin spice latte of, <laughs> of the uh, native except they're, world. Not basic, they're not basic <laughs> but they have a real um in the best like, a deeply like um spicy kind of like nutmeg mm -hmm. allspice kind of a cinnamony 
uh, sort of vibe to them. So they make a really great fall dessert. You can make tons and tons of stuff with persimmons. They're pretty easy to clean too. Um, and the skins are good also. Yeah. So I, my goal this weekend is actually to collect some persimmons so that I can uh, spread it on toast. Cause it's already got this kind of like jam preserve type consistency. Yeah. Um, and I saw my friend, farmer Dan was uh, smearing it on, on a biscuit. And I thought that looked really yummy. Yeah, so you can find that, but a word of caution with these yes. fruits, if they're not ripe, they're going to turn your mouth inside out. Yes. Um, they're extremely tannic before yeah. they're ripe. And that's a sort of defense mechanism that a lot of native fruits use is that they're, they're, the fruits are really, really tannic and sa or sour or whatever before they're actually ripe, which keeps animals like us from eating them before the seeds are ready mm -hmm. to uh, be mature. So, yeah. So the way I can kind of tell is when the skins get a little softer and loose and you can feel how squishy the, the meat of the fruit yeah. is underneath. And a good indicator is if the cap comes off too, like if, like when you're picking them from the tree, if the, not, sorry, not if the cap comes off, but if the fruit itself comes off the tree easily. really easily, um, that's good. You don't want to be picking green ones off the tree. Yeah, no doubt. Yeah. So you can find these all around Kansas City too. You can even find them in our urban areas. Yes. We probably got these from the persimmon tree that's, I'm not going to tell you where, but one <laughs> block away from the Discovery Yes. In an old abandoned lot where yeah. we are the only ones who pick them. <laughs> that's right. Us yeah. Americans. That's right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. All yeah. right. Yeah. Well, Tammy, that that's all we've got for our autumn shrubs and trees. Do we have time for some questions? I believe we do. All right, we have some really good questions too. So right. one of the questions is, um, I think you answered that, is the spice bush swallowtail caterpillar host specific? Yes. Yeah, it is. Um, and I saw, I think it was Kevin Syke mentioned that it is not um, a host to sassafras. I think. Sorry. That's... Okay. <laughs> Thank you, I Kevin. I don't know what I was thinking of. <laughs> Never mind. Something eats sassafras. <laughs> Something. Something. Sassafras is a great fall tree, too. That's native to Missouri. Yeah. Uh, how We're tall? Oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I'm just saying, I, I'll, I'll be honest, I'm learning butterflies. So. <laughs> oh, I think but that's we all are. Yeah, that's what I love yeah. about nature. There's always something new to learn, and that's why I will never get bored or tired, because there's always right. a million things to And learn. I'm never going to forget that now, since I've been <laughs> called out on in public. <laughs> we, we talked about that. The hard yeah, lessons are right. the only ones we get. <laughs> how about, from Roberta, how tall and wide does spice bush grow? That's yeah. a great question. So spice bush is also considered an understory tree. The ones we have here get to be, they're about like 10 feet tall. The one we just saw maybe was 15. Well, I think the one we just saw it was pretty been, tall. Mm, was I'm it? short. I'm so. really short. Uh, <laughs> it was probably like nine or 10 feet. I think when I have the one yeah. right here it, or the one right here, this one's only this is pretty short ish. Um, it, it's growing in shade, like in its natural habitat. Yeah. But I'd say they're five to six feet typically. Yeah. Um, and then you can, they're super easy to prune. So you can mm -hmm. really cut them into whatever, whatever shape, shape you, want. you want. You I, can keep them short. Yeah. And I was doing a little research on them. And yeah, I remember six to 10 feet, I think is average. And then I think they get about as wide as they do tall. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. And does it like moist soil? Well, Kevin asks if it likes yeah. moist soil. He thinks his oh, might oh. be in a little dry location. The spice bush, I, so it likes, um, it does like a little bit of moisture. It doesn't tolerate super clay soil as well. So it does prefer loamy soil. When we were down at Mingo, we saw a bunch of spice bush. And so there was a lot, of, I guess it was pretty wet down there though. It was, um, yeah, it was, so it might be a variable moisture tolerance. For yeah. I would plant. say me medium to dry. Probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Not okay. wet. Yeah. And here's a good one from Debbie. What was the plant or tree with the red berries? Was it spice bush? You had two. We did have two. So the first one we spoke of at the very top of the show was spice bush. And the one we just mentioned over here was winterberry. And Tammy has put both the common and botanical names in the chat for you all to reference too. 
Okay. And it looks like, looks like that's all the time we're going to have, but, but everyone hold on, hold on. We're going to uh, have a little bit of a, a nice little surprise here toward the end. So just bear with us. Um, you two just absolutely kill it every single time. We so enjoy you. So thank you so much. Go ahead and stay on you two. Um, we do recommend you guys head out to the Discovery Center. You might think that it's getting cool and that there's not much to see, but there is so much to see out there. Uh, there's some, a lot of life out there still, and uh, you'll see a lot of of habitat, lots of birds still, lots of butterflies, and there's still a lot of color. You saw that aromatic aster. If you wanna find out other activities going on at the Discovery Center, just go to mdc.go, or I'm sorry, mdc.mo.gov and search for events that are going on out there. You can see Alex and Sydney. If you've missed any of our episodes, you can find them on the deeproots.org website. And while you're there, if you would consider uh, making a donation to Deep Roots, we would certainly, certainly appreciate that. As we sign off today, we are going to, to give you a little bit of a show so that we're doing a proper goodbye to Sarah. We love you, Sarah. And we, we love you, Sarah. You have been such a great and gracious host of Native Plants at Noon. So we're just gonna do a little dance off for you because we appreciate you so, so much. You are the best. We love you, Sarah. We love you, Sarah. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> thank you, Sarah. And thank you everybody for joining us today. We appreciate it. <laughs> thank you, ladies. We do love you, Sarah. <laughs> Bye. Bye.